Hey guys, welcome back to the Girl Gone London channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I'm an American expat who's lived in the UK for almost 10 years. I'm originally from Florida and now I live in the southeast of England. In today's video, I am talking all about the differences between American homes and British homes. Now, before I get into the 11 differences, I also want to mention if you are considering moving to the UK, whether it's just a dream or whether you're actually doing it soon, or even whether you have a trip planned in the future and want to know more about British culture and British life, definitely check out the Girl Gone London book, which you can find on Amazon, basically anywhere in the world. This is a book I wrote specifically about life in the UK as an American, but it also pertains to people from other countries. I just use the US as a comparison. I would also welcome you to join the Ultimate London and UK Travel Guide group and you can go ahead and click in the link in the description. This is my free Facebook group. We have over 5,000 members and we all come together to talk about uh, planning trips to the UK, moving to the UK, and it's filled with just people who are interested in the UK and in Britain. Let's get on to the first thing. Now, number one difference are the electrical outlets. So an electrical outlet in the US is just an outlet and you plug something in and the current goes through and it charges whatever you're plugging in. There are differences in how the outlets actually look, but I feel like most people know that. So the British outlets do look different than outlets from around the world. However, what I really wanted to point out was that outlets here have to be turned on. So even if you plug something in, that doesn't mean the, that the electrical current is automatically flowing. I have had so many times where I plug something in and just walk away and forget that I haven't actually switched on the outlet and came back to find that nothing had happened. So if you are visiting the UK, always remember you have to turn on the outlet. Okay, number two, we're talking about heating and cooling. So for heating, radiators are what is most commonly used in the UK. Now I'm from Florida, so I am going to say that I knew nothing about heating in general until moving here. And I know that some places in the US do use radiators, but a lot of places use air heating systems. So here it's mostly radiators and that is basically water going into this structure and heating it up and that is releasing heat into the room, you can change the level of heat that is coming from your radiator. There's usually like a one to six dial. There are also other things that you have to learn when coming to the UK, like bleeding your radiator, which is basically letting out excess air but they can get super, super hot, which is the point, but you do have to kind of be careful around them, not hang things over them because you might start a fire. I have one that actually is really close to my foot when I sleep because of the way of the room, and I often singe my toes in the morning, in the winter. And in terms of cooling, there's not really air conditioning here. It's getting more popular maybe like in some hotels. The summers do feel like they're getting getting warmer and they're getting more of an intense summer. So the line has always been like, well, we don't need air conditioning because it's not really hot that often, which is kind of true, but I feel like it's becoming increasingly not true. Anyway, being from Florida, I had no idea how to cope with the world without air conditioning because my whole life up until that point had been air conditioned. We don't currently have air conditioning in our house. It's very expensive to install. You can find people to install it, but it is a whole ordeal. However, we did decide to install, and by we did decide, I mean I said we are definitely doing this whether you like it or not, ceiling fans. Ceiling fans, again, not popular in the UK, maybe not even as popular up north in the US, but again, being from Florida, I'm like, we can't not have air conditioning and not have a ceiling fan. So if you go to a British B&B or you stay at a British friend's house or even go to a lot of hotels, you're not gonna find air conditioning. So this is really something to keep in mind if you're coming in the summer. Hey guys, it's Kaylin from the future as I'm editing. Something happened to my camera footage, so I just wanted to catch you up. We are on number three, and I was in the process of telling you about how British houses are much smaller than American houses. So we're gonna jump back into the video, but know that we are now talking about British house sizes compared to American house sizes. Here we have a two up, two down house, which is two rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs and like, a very box situation. And our home is, I think we've worked it out, it's about 700 square feet, 
which is smaller than my friend's studio apartment when she lived in Dallas and I know everything's bigger in Texas, but this is kind of a standard size of a starter home, if not smaller here in the UK. Obviously, if you live up north or in more rural areas, then you might expect more space, but you're gonna be paying more for it. So let's just say on the whole, comparing countries, the houses here are so much smaller and that's why people often say, do not bring all of your furniture over if you move from the US because you will bring your couch that looked really great in your US house and it will take up your entire house from wall to wall and just won't be a good situation. Now, number four is related to that. We're going to talk about the structure of a British house. So I do tell this anecdote in the Girl Gone London book, but basically, I live in what is known as a mid-terrace house. It's basically like a, like a, well, it's not a condo because it's a house that we own. What would we call them? Like a townhome. So it is uh, surrounded on either side with other people's houses. So we do not have any sort of side yard. Our walls are shared. And again, this is not an apartment. This is not like a shared, this is, we own our house, but we are attached at either end. So I sent my grandma a picture when we first moved into our house and it just had the other houses like in the terrace, but I was just showing our front door and I said, look, we purchased our first home and here's what it looks like. And she was like, oh my God, I am so proud of you. Like, look at all that space. Like you are just, you are living the dream. And I was like, I think she thinks I own the whole street. And I had to clarify and I was like, oh yeah, that's our front door and those are our neighbors. Like I own that one window out front and that one like tiny sliver. And she was like, oh. The terraced housing is super popular here in the UK. And if you've been to a city in America, you might have seen, especially like the older cities, so like not Orlando, but you know, if you've been to New York or Boston or somewhere, you might be familiar with the idea of houses basically being connected with no side yards. That is a super popular form of building here. So you have a mid terrace, which is the house right in the middle between two other houses. The row can go on for quite a while. So you could have multiple mid terrace houses and then you could have a end of terrace house, which is a house that is attached at, in a terrace, but it's at the very end. Or you can have a semi detached, which is usually when two homes are attached in that center wall and each one is called semi detached. If you have a house that is not attached to anybody else's house, that is called a detached house. And when my husband and I were first house shopping and talking about life here in the UK, he was like, oh, you know, I'm, I would really love to own a detached house. And I'm like, a what? And he's like, a detached house, like a detached house. And I'm like, detached from like, what are you talking about? And then we finally figured out and he pointed to a detached house and he was like, what would you call that? And I was like, like a how a house. That's just what I picture as a standard house. Another thing is that they call one story detached houses. So basically the kind of home that is in the vast majority of Florida, they call them bungalows, which I think of bungalows as like a tropical island paradise getaway. And I can confirm that a bungalow here is not a tropical paradise getaway. It is often something that they consider like older people to live in um, because most of the houses here have multiple stories. Again, they've built up, not out, but they do call a single story detached house. Uh, they call it a bungalow. Number five, let's talk about the bathroom. So I have multiple different bathroom differences that we'll get to, but the first one I want to talk about is also to do with electricity and the bathroom. So it is against building code in the UK to have any sort of like a uh, switch to turn on the light unless it's a pull cord which you might have never seen in the US, but if you can imagine a cord dangling from the ceiling, you pull it, the light comes on. So you cannot have a regular light switch to turn on your bathroom light inside the bathroom. And they consider this for electrical reasons because the bathroom is like filled with water and steam and they consider that a hazard. So 
all of the bathroom light switches are going to be on the outside of the bathroom. So if you go into a bathroom here in an Airbnb or similar, you will need to turn on the light before you even walk into the room. If you walk into the room, close the door behind you, there's probably not going to be a light switch in there to turn it on. And the second thing also has to do with plugs in the bathroom. So this drives me up the wall because there are things in the bathroom like a hairdryer or a curling iron or something like that that you would want to plug in. They again think that is a huge hazard, that is a huge no-no. You cannot have open plugs like a regular socket inside the bathroom. So you can have like what they call a shaving point and so uh, I will show you right now there is kind of it looks like a funny type of outlet and that is literally for usually your like electric toothbrush charger will have that kind of end as well as a shaver will have that kind of charging point at the end so those are the only things that you can plug in in the bathroom but if you want to plug in really anything else that needs a normal plug you cannot do it they consider that really dangerous Okay, now number six is also about the bathroom and it is specifically about the toilet. So let me tell you a story of when I first landed in the UK and I was in the bathroom in Heathrow Airport. I remember this vividly and I looked at the toilet and I was like, I don't know how to use this. So it's not that it's like super foreign looking. It does just kind of look like a toilet, but when it comes to flushing, in America, we're often used to a handle to pull. Well, they don't do handles here in the UK. They have this like push button system. And it gets confusing because there are two buttons within each other. So there's a smaller button and there's a bigger button. Now, I had always assumed for the longest time, probably until like last year, and I've lived here for a long time, that the smaller button was going to be a number one and the bigger button was a number two. Turns out that is not even true. So the bigger button is for a, um, a lesser flush. So you're not using as much water, you don't need as much water if you catch my drift, and that is the bigger, the bigger button because it's easier for you to kind of like locate the bigger button with your hand, it's more commonly used, whatever. And the smaller button, is actually the one that you would use if you need more water for your flush. So that is something to keep in mind on how to flush the toilet. Again, I have had friends visit me in here in the UK and they're like, I don't know how to like flush the toilet. You could also be in a situation where you have a pull cord flush. So especially like in an old pub or an old building, you literally have to pull a cord from the ceiling to flush the toilet. And I would also say, here in the UK, you have to press things for longer for it to work. So again, I have been so panicky over the fact that I cannot flush the toilet and it's simply because I needed to hold it. I'm really used to a system in the States where you pull a lever or you push something and it immediately happens. Oftentimes here with the old plumbing or old cords, whatever you do need to just like keep pressing. Okay, so the sun has actually come out surprisingly today and is like, in my window so sorry if the lighting is a little bit strange it's very hard to light a video here in the UK because one minute it is super dark and the next minute the Sun is finally showing itself and then in two seconds later it will go away so moving on to number seven let's talk about washing machines and dryers and where they go so washing machines are common dryers not as much a lot of people might have a combi washing machine and dryer all in one the dryer part of it typically doesn't work that well but it's a way to save space especially in a very small home so the washing machine slash dryer often goes in the kitchen so if you have a larger house then you might be able to have what they call a utility which is basically a laundry room but that's not even going to be that large but most people you live in an apartment you live in a small house you are going to have your washing machine in your kitchen and that is so odd for Americans because it's just not a place that most of us would ever put our washing machine we would have some closet like off to the side if we didn't have a ton of room but the Brits put theirs right in the kitchen. Number eight, I just like flashed a five. Number eight, mixer taps or faucets as we call them in the US. So 
In the US, it's very common to have one faucet and you turn it on and you go to hot or you go to cold. Here in the UK, especially in the past, it was incredibly common to have two separate taps so the water could not mix. So one was cold and one was hot. And the reason for this was actually because the hot water back in the day might have been contaminated because of a different system that they used to heat up the water and it was like sitting for a long time so they didn't want that to mix with the cold water which would have been the drinking water. Nowadays there are a lot of buildings that are still kind of having those old plumbing systems or it's just a, a fact of life here that people are used to. So you have one scalding faucet and one freezing cold faucet and this is usually fine if you're like brushing your teeth or something, but when you go to wash your face or wash your hands, it is a constant battle of like, do I want to be cold? Do I want to have a third degree burn? And if not, you can turn them both on and try and like collect the water and mix it all together yourself, but it usually doesn't work. Now, this is not to say that there are not mixer taps in the UK. It is becoming more and more common. People do want that in their homes when they upgrade. But again, if you go to an old building, an old pub or something like that, and you see two separate taps, you are not going to be able to turn either one of them to give you lukewarm. One is going to be scalding and one is going to be freezing. And that is part of the fun of living in the UK. Number nine, let's talk about sinks because sinks are something that you don't actually think of being super important until you have one that doesn't quite work for what you need. So here in the UK, again, small houses, they're all smushed together. They don't have a ton of room. So it's incredibly common to have just like a single small stainless steel sink, but also they could have a single sink plus a half sink, or you could have a single sink plus what they call like, like a vegetable washing area or something, which is basically like a half sink, but it's not just half one way, it's half depth too. And this, used to drive me insane because I was like, what is the point of this half sink? Like either give me a sink or don't give me a sink and save the space, but this half sink, I don't really understand. So someone explained it to me as if you have your washing up in the main sink, then you can pour your tea out in the other sink. That is literally the explanation that they gave me. Another thing to really think about when it comes to sinks that you might find here, especially like in an Airbnb, is Brits love this thing that they call a washing up bowl. Now, I try on this channel not to be too derogatory towards things in the UK. Part of being an expat is learning to adapt and I totally agree with that, but I feel like I've lived here 10 years and I have paid my dues to be able to talk about this very important issue. So a washing up bowl to me is like, it's like a bucket and they put it in their sink to do dishes in. But this bowl often takes up the whole entire sink. And again, I've heard this explained to me like, oh, we like to save water. So we don't want to fill up the whole sink with water when we could just fill up this bowl and then we can just like dump out the bowl to this day. I have not heard a convincing argument as to why you need a bowl within what essentially is another bowl. So as soon as I moved to the UK and really caught wind of what was happening, I banished all washing up bowls or buckets or whatever from my house and my husband kind of agreed, yeah, I don't really know why we use them, we just do. Again, if it's to save water, like that is very noble. But the problem is you then limit your already small sink size because you have basically just put in a smaller sink into your sink and what happens is like you'll get like rings of like dirty water and like dirty food like where the bowl has been and you have to dump out the bowl and like why are we dumping out the bowl when we could just fill up the sink with water and wash the dishes so if you know a Brit are a Brit have a good explanation for washing up bowl please do tell me I don't really understand where they came from, what they're for, but a lot of people have them. And in our house, we redid our kitchen and we basically redid it around the fact that I wanted a double sink. And I will say, 
every British person who comes over is very envious of our sink and their mind is kind of blown at the possibilities of having a full double sink. So maybe that will catch on, maybe not. But that is my tirade on washing up bowls and the differences between American and British sinks. Okay, number eight is a quick one, and I just wanted to talk about microwaves. So in the US, we often have microwaves above our oven. It's very common to have them suspended above the oven. I mean, sometimes you can have them out on the counter, but it's a very common like American thing to think of a kitchen and you think of the microwave above the oven. That is definitely, definitely, definitely not a thing here. The microwave is either going to be on the counter, stowed away, or like in a cupboard somewhere that you have to open and use, but I have never ever seen a microwave suspended above the oven in the UK. And our final one, number 11, you've made it to the end. We are going to talk about the oven. So the oven in the US is often a detached oven, like you purchase your oven and you slot it in which I mean you do here as well, but stay with me. So an American oven is often the oven plus the stove top as one. Here, you do have an oven that you would purchase that you would slot in, but you would have the countertop go over it and then you would have your stove top on top of that. So it's a much more integrated look. Whereas in the US, you can literally just like if you pull out your oven, you will have a whole massive gap. Whereas in the UK, if you take out your oven, you'll still have your counter and your stove on top. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the video. Comment below and let me know which was the most surprising difference to you. If you want more UK content, make sure to subscribe to be notified of those videos on Mondays and Thursdays. Let me know where you're watching from. I love to meet people and see where you are in the world. And I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.